So volumes. I think it's fair to say that at the time of developing this course, volumes are still not quite first class citizens in the Docker world. But there are plans afoot to rectify this. Meaning some significant improvements coming to volumes in the not too distant future, I think. And I don't really want to get into the world of guessing too much, but I think at a bare minimum we'll see a dedicated Docker volume subcommand that allows us to manage volumes. Think Docker volume create, Docker volume ls, Docker volume rm, yeah? But also some more architectural things like named remote volumes and the likes. So we'll learn the fundamentals here. They're absolutely valid and will be for a long time, but let's keep our eyes peeled looking for updates in the future. And obviously, keep an eye out here on Pluralsight too for more Docker related courses. Anyway, at a high level, volumes are all about decoupling data and volumes from containers. And they're also about sharing data between containers. The high level theory is pretty much specify a directory or a mount point within a container and store any data written to that location outside of the container's union file system. Basically, store the data in a directory on the Docker host's file system. This way, if the container gets stopped or even deleted, the data persists as it's decoupled from the container. Let's see it. So we'll go docker run, yeah? We'll make this container interactive. Then we specify a volume like this. Now I just randomly picked the name or the mount point test vol. I could just as easily have named it data, logs, whatever. And I'm gonna name the container voltainer. And then I think we know all of the rest of this by now. Okay, we're inside of our container. An LSL, yeah, that shows us the volume there. But let me highlight it, yeah? Because that lovely purple doesn't quite work so well on our dark grey background. Now it's worth noting, right? Docker created that volume when it created the container. The test vol directory doesn't already have to exist. But if it does, then normal Unix mount rules apply. That is, any data that already exists in the mount point becomes unavailable while there's a volume mounted in it. And let's go create a quick file. Ah, rats. Thought Nano was pre-installed. Let's just get that quickly installed. Okay, we're back. Try again. Better. Put some random text in, like that. And save. Okay, let's drop out of this container with Control P and Q, and we'll see if we can find where on the Docker hosts file system the volume's been created. Now, I don't know if you remember, a few modules back, we said that Docker Inspect is a real treasure trove of container detail. Well, let's Docker Inspect Voltainer. Oh, and how convenient is that? There's our volume data right there. So our test data volume and where it's located on the Docker host. And see how it's listed as read write down here too? Well, I reckon if we list the contents of that folder here, yeah look, it even tab completes our file. Let's cut that out as well. Bingo, there's our data. Now other containers can access that volume too and share its contents. So we can spin up another container, make it interactive too, and then we go volumes from Voltaina. Then Ubuntu again, and we'll go with a bash shell. LSL, and there's our volume with our file. Yeah, and we can access that volume from this container even if the Voltaina container, oh, like that, is stopped or deleted. So that really is decoupling data and volumes from containers. Now then, we can also mount a directory from our Docker host into a container called a host mount. So I don't know, maybe we have a shared data directory on our Docker host and we want to bind mount it into every container we launch on this host. Well, we could just launch containers with the minus V slash data colon slash data and that'll mount the data directory 
from our Docker host into a mount point called slash data inside of the container. And it's as simple as that. But make sure you keep this in mind. Doing this isn't very scalable and it pretty much locks our containers to this particular Docker host. Unless I guess all of our Docker hosts have the exact same config and some funky shared backend storage that they all see, which to me sounds a bit scary and is probably asking for trouble. As well, it's the kind of thing that sounds like it might make porting containers from dev into prod pretty difficult, as we're then relying on dev and prod being exactly the same. And I don't know, feels a bit... Mm, I don't know, I'm just not the hugest fan of that approach. Whoa, hang on. <laughs> Are you serious? I haven't even mentioned volumes in a Docker file yet. Sorry, honestly, I guess I kind of got carried away in the zone there, yeah? Well, volumes in a Docker file are simple enough anyway. We've already explained and demoed the theory. So if we drop out of this container, open up our Docker file, yeah, in here we just go volume and then maybe slash data. That there will make the data directory in any containers launched from images built with this Docker file store their data in the Docker hosts file system. Simple as that. But note this, the volume instruction from within a Docker file doesn't allow us to do a host mount where we mount a file or a directory from the host into a container. No, we can't do that from within a Docker file, just from the Docker run command. So that's volumes. Oh dear me, no, I'm off the ball a bit here aren't I? To delete volumes, the only current method is to delete it within its container by doing docker rm minus v and then the name of the container. If we just delete the container without specifying minus v, then the volume doesn't get deleted, which can be good, right? So here in our lab, we would go docker stop voltainer and then docker rm minus v voltainer. There we go. That's our voltainer container and its volume gone. Anyway, anyway, that's the end of yet another module. Let's do a quick recap of the main things that we've learned.